for your request. I'm recording this, so now is your opportunity. Ask away. I had a quick question. Um, for the hypothalamus, the um, inhibiting and releasing hormones, they target the anterior pituitary. Uh, were, were there, was there any uh, regulation or functions um, mentioned? So remember, as we talked about, that is the top of the system. That is, so basically it's higher order neural processing, you know, hormonal control, chemical signals, it's everything. So as we mentioned, it isn't something that would necessarily be a question I would ask you on the exam because it's more complicated than that, but that's the command center. So obviously there, uh, what causes us to make those decisions is something far more complicated than something as simple as thyroid stimulating hormones stimulating the thyroid gland. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's what I yeah. thought. Yeah. I mean, really, all of those things, hormonal, humoral, and neural, all are going to play a role in, in the decisions that the hypothalamus makes. So, you know, really, I guess if there was an answer, the answer would be all of the above. Uh, professor, I had a question. Yes. Um, maybe this is more of a, like a broader question. Um, but so when we were doing the um, ELISA test mm -hmm. on like the Physio X, and then the uh, we also did an actual simulation of it, there is a part of it. Um, I was actually having trouble understanding exactly the process of getting to the results. Could you go a bit more in depth on that? Yes. So uh, the key to remember with the ELISA is with the ELISA test, there is a direct test. And the direct is when you are actually looking for, uh, in the case of like, for instance, you know, HIV or something like that, it would be the virus that you're looking for. Whereas in the indirect, uh, you are looking for antibodies, the presence of antibodies for that particular virus. Uh, so in simple terms, the way this occurs, you have a well for the direct test. And that, that well is already coated on the surface with antibodies that have the specific binding site for the virus. So then what happens is you put your solution in there and you let it sit and then you rinse it out and all those types of things. And let's take, we'll look at two side by side. If the solution doesn't have the virus, then clearly there's nothing to bind to that antibody. However, if the solution does have the virus, then the virus will bind to that antibody that's on its surface. Okay? So that was the first thing. You start with the solution. Oops. So step one, uh, the fluid, blood fluid, or the, the body fluid that you're testing. Okay? Mm -hmm. So then next, you then add an antibody solution. This antibody is specific for the, uh, for the virus. So obviously in the case here, there is something, oops, let's change colors. Uh, there is something for the antibody to bind to. So the antibody will bind to that uh, virus, but obviously there's nothing for it to bind to in this case, in the negative, mm -hmm. all right? So the second thing you're doing is you're adding a specific antibody. The reason we do this is because as we've talked about, this antibody, as we know, this portion of it right here is a constant region that is always the same in all antibodies. So the third thing we can add is then a color reagent. When we add that color reagent, oops, it is specifically able to bind to that constant region of the antibody. And when it binds, that reaction of it causes a color. So in the case of a positive test, you are gonna get a color to your, uh, uh, to your uh, well, 
and because the color reagent binds to the specific antibody, the more virus that's in there, the darker the color it's going to be as well. So color can also be an indication of how much of it is present. Whereas notice there's nothing for that color reagent to bind to in the case of the negative. So that negative is gonna be clear. And so it's because of this interaction between the color reagent and the antibody that is binding to the antigen that that direct test, direct ELISA looking specifically for that virus works. Got it. Okay, so if you think about it, for the indirect, basically you're skipping a step. You have two wells, and on these two wells, again, you're baking into the surface of these wells, basically the antigens that the antibody can bind to. So that when you put the bodily fluid in there, if there is an antibody present, it will bind to those antigens. Whereas again, this one has the antigens on the surface. Oh, I guess I should make those blue for consistency. If you don't have the antibodies, then you don't have anything that can bind to it. And again, you add a color reagent that will react with the presence of the antibody. So you're still getting a color with a positive and no color for the negative. And you're just here, you're testing for the presence of the antibody, whereas here you're testing specifically for the presence of the virus. But the process is essentially the same. Got it. Okay, that greatly cleared it up. Thank you. Excellent. I'm glad to be of service. All right. Any other questions on the ELISA? All right. Next question. that it? Excellent. We're done and ready for the exam then. That means you've all mastered it and I can make the test harder. Hold on, hold on. Let me think of something. <laughs> <laughs> All kidding aside, I, like I said, I, I know we have a couple of days before the exam, and I know uh, many of you have been focused uh, maybe even a little too much on your presentations. Again, I tried to warn you about that at the beginning, that while the presentation is worth 50 points, uh, your lecture exam is worth 100, your lab exam is probably going to be worth around 60, 65, somewhere around there, 55 to 65. Uh, great question, Tiffany. I'll answer that in a second. Um, so uh, we'll want to do that. Oh, and there's another good question too. So, all right, let me get to those in a second. Um, but as always, you can email me if you have questions and stuff like that as well. All right, so let's go with Tiffany's first. Uh, phagocytosis. Excellent. And now we, we talked about it first, but now that we've talked about the immune response, we can uh, be even more specific about this. So as we know, uh, the um, phagocyte, has binding sites on its outer surface. And one of the primary things that this, uh, these phagocytes are looking for are abnormal proteins or things along those lines, or it could be, for instance, some virus that has one of those antibody flags that we talked about. Again, whatever its antigen is, and let's say its antigen for argument's sake is blue rectangles. We have this antibody that is bound to it. And as we know, that uh, stem, the constant region, is the same on all antibodies. So notice it doesn't matter what pathogen it is bound to. That's why this is nonspecific. Because it's not that it's binding to that blue rectangle. It is binding to that constant region of the antibody, which is the same for all antibodies. So that constant. Uh, uh, region binds to the phagocyte and the phagocyte brings that in. 
via that process of endocytosis. So it is gonna endocytose and bring in to a vesicle that particular virus with its antigens. And what are we gonna call this vesicle containing our virus? Phagosome. Exactly, excellent. Now, as we know, this phagocyte is a true cell. Oops, put that back. I just need more room to play with. So that means it has all of the normal cell stuff. Right, it has a nucleus, it has a rough endoplasmic reticulum, it has a Golgi apparatus, all of those things, mitochondria, all of those things that you would expect a cell to have. And among the things we expect cells to have is that this cell is going to have lysosomes. And remind me again what a lysosome is? Organelle. Yeah, it's an organelle that contains what? Hydrolytic enzymes. Yeah, it contains hydrolytic enzymes, enzymes that break stuff down. So what's gonna happen is this lysosome is going to fuse with our phagosome. And when it fuses with our phagosome, Basically, it releases all of those digestive enzymes, and those digestive enzymes break up our virus into all its bits and pieces, including those antigens. And what do we call this structure that is formed when the lysosome uh, attaches to the vesicle containing the virus? Phagolysosome. Phagolysosome, excellent. Which, like I said, I would be shocked if you didn't have to spell. Although I guess since the questions are random, there's a chance you might not have to. But if we were taken in person, I guarantee you would be. Excellent. Now, as we know, most of this material is going to be released from the cell uh, via exocytosis. However, as we also know, most is not all. So some of this stuff is just gonna be, it's, you know, again, it's, it's uh, amino acids, it's uh, nucleotides, it's all these things that are building blocks that the cell can use. However, as we now also understand that within this plasma membrane, within these vesicles, are some major histocompatibility complexes. And which class? Second. Class one. One? Two. Two? I've heard both. Which one's right? Two. Class two, major histocompatibility complexes. And they are going to grab a hold of some of those antigens from when we broke it down. So that when this vesicle binds and releases its material via exocytosis, that class two major histocompatibility complex will now be expressing that external protein that it found in the outside world, not one that it made inside, but one that it found in the outside world, it'll now be expressing it on its surface, make it in an antigen presenting cell, which will stimulate and activate what type of cells? What type of cells are activated by the class two major compatibility complex? CD4. CD4, excellent, absolutely. It's gonna stimulate that CD4 uh, T cell, which most of which become what? Once activated. Helper T cells? Helper T cells, exactly. Some will become memory, some will become suppressor, but as we know, most will become helper T cells. All right. 
Excellent. Did that answer your question, Tiffany? Yeah, thank you. Excellent. Any other questions on this process? All right, then I see Claudia had a question as well. Uh, I haven't read it yet. Yes, uh, absolutely. I, I would say that of all the tests in this section, probably the this one is the one that's going to have the most histology. Um, uh, we saw histology of all the uh, most many of the lymphatic tissues. So those are things that you could be responsible for. Uh, all of the endocrine glands we saw the histology for. Uh, again, and then we'll use pictures of the illustrations from your textbook, pictures of the charts, uh, those types of materials. But yeah, as we said, one of the things that makes this section so challenging is it's all tissues, it's all cells, it's all molecular. Uh, so uh, there may be some illustrations of processes. You know, I could show you a picture, a beautiful picture like this and ask you to identify the process this describes, or I could have a big fat arrow pointing at that phagolysosome and ask you to identify that structure or things along those lines. Uh, but yeah, this one is gonna be a lot of cellular, a lot of chemical stuff. So there's gonna be a lot of histology, uh, probably the most histology in all of uh, uh, 431 is gonna be this test. So yes, that is one of the challenges for this one. All right, but there is some gross anatomy as well, uh, especially for the lymphatic system. So those are things you need to know as well. So it's not all it's not all histology, but there is probably the most of any section. Probably this one and, and the next one, the digestive has a lot of histology as well. So, although, but not nearly as much as this one. But uh, again, if you think of all the organs in the digestive system, each of them have a you know gross and microscopic anatomy we're gonna do working on but again we don't have to worry about that till all of next week all right excellent yes, yes go ahead um i have a histology question uh sure. for a uh, spleen histology mm -hmm. oh i was confused the white pulp is same as lymphatic nodule yes and uh is there germinal um what was it the germinal center inside of it absolutely so yes with uh, again Remember, as we've talked about, a lymphatic nodule is a lymphatic nodule is a lymphatic nodule, right? Actually, I don't like that. Let's do that again. We'll use the dark one first. So when we look at these lymphatic nodules, a lymphatic nodule looks the same pretty much wherever it is lymph node, tonsils, spleen, appendix, uh, pyrus patch in the, the, uh, the small intestine, they all look pretty much the same. They have this dark outer layer with the lighter colored inner region to them that are gonna be the same. So uh, when we're identifying these, what we're really looking for are differences in context clues. So one of the big differences about the spleen is that unlike the tonsils, unlike the, um, the lymph node, unlike these other areas, they're not clustered together on one side. Like if you think of the lymph node, they're all the lymphatic follicles are in the cortex and there's none of them in the medulla. In the spleen, they're spread out more. So they're kind of randomly distributed throughout the red pulp. Uh, and uh, yes, they are going to have that, um, right, again, now, again, depending on how you cut through it, you may not always see the germinal center, but the germinal center is present in all of them. However, again, what you're really going to be looking for, a key factor you're going to be looking for in our um, spleen is you're also going to be looking for that central artery passing through it, right? And again, it's not always going to be perfect in the middle. It may be a little offset. Uh, you may even see it in a cross section where you see a little blood vessel uh, kind of here in cross section through that that way. And again, some of you may not see them, but as you know, I'm always gonna use obvious examples of things. So there's no way I'm gonna show you a spleen slide that doesn't have at least some central arteries in them so that you know what it is that I'm looking that you're looking at. So that's gonna be, while there is a germinal center, it's really that central artery that's gonna be the dead giveaway that you are looking at the spleen. 
So they're kind of distributed out. Again, the spleen also has that fibrous capsule. So often on one side, you may see a fibrous capsule on the edge of it. Uh, yes, if you don't process the tissue, the inner portion looks red because of all the stored hemoglobin from the breakdown of red blood cells. And the follicles don't have hemoglobin in them, so they're more whitish in color. But as we know, if they use different stains, those colors can change. So color isn't always something that you're going to want to focus on, but these follicles are always going to be randomly distributed, and there will always be at least a couple that will have a central artery. All right. Okay, thank you. And would you accept both white, white pulp or uh, spleen nodules uh, if you ask like point? Yeah, both of those would be acceptable. Okay. Yep. Could you go over uh, uh, hypothalamic uh, control of the anterior and posterior pituitary, the uh, steps involved? Sure. We did it with an illustration last time, which is fun, but I think sometimes that can be a little confusing. So let's talk about, let's just do it with vocabulary. Excellent. How does the hypothalamus control the anterior pituitary? Hormonally. Excellent. All right. What do we know about the anterior pituitary? It's made of glandular tissue. Excellent. And because it is glandular tissue, it both makes and stores its own hormones. So uh, it, the production and release, and actually that's do that. So production and release of anterior pituitary hormones is controlled by two classes of hormones. And what are the two classes of hormones? What kind of hormones does the hypothalamus make? Inhibiting and releasing hormones. Exactly. One class is releasing hormones. And what do the class of releasing hormones do? Trigger the release of hormones and whatever their target is. Yeah, exactly. They increase production and release of the anterior pituitary hormone. Now, again, this is a class of hormones so that there's going to be all sorts of specific types. For example, there is a thyroid stimulating hormone, releasing hormone, which tells the anterior pituitary to produce and release more thyroid stimulating hormone. Uh, there is a follicle stimulating hormone, releasing hormone, right? And et cetera. So each hormone that we talked about in the anterior pituitary, the hypothalamus makes a specific hormone that tells just that specific portion of the gland to make and release that specific hormone. And as you've also mentioned, there is also a class of hormones called inhibiting hormones. And as you mentioned, inhibiting hormones are going to decrease Production and release of the anterior pituitary hormones. And again, there's going to be lots of specific types. There's going to be inhibiting thyroid stimulating hormone and inhibiting uh, follicle stimulating hormone. Oops, that's not a hormone. I did it again. Etc. You know, and, and so on and so forth. Prolactin inhibiting and releasing hormones. So all of these have specific types that are released. And then the only trick is then how do we get 
the hypothalamus hormone to the anterior pituitary, right? Normally when we think of circulating hormones, we put it in the blood, and once we put it in the blood, it goes everywhere. And once it goes everywhere, we know it's eventually going to get where we need it to go. We could certainly do that with the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary, but it isn't necessarily as efficient. right? We want this to be a very efficient process, especially because they're sitting right next to each other. So how do we solve that problem? Isn't there a portal system? Exactly. This uses a portal system called the right, pituitary portal system or a hypothalamic, uh, uh, hypothalamic uh, portal system. Hypophyseal portal system? Yeah, or hypophyseal, that would work as well. Remember, hypophysis is just a fancy name for pituitary gland portal system which is that second capillary. So basically it's a two capillary system where the first that are, we have two capillaries connected together. Let's say it that way. All right, one in the hypothalamus and one in the anterior pituitary. So capillaries or exchange take place. So the release and inhibiting hormones get in in the hypothalamus, they get out in the anterior pituitary. All right, that makes sense? Yes. That's the trickier process, right? The nice thing, it's it, it, but what they're doing here and in the back Much simpler, because what do we know about the posterior pituitary? It's made of uh, neural tissue. Yeah, it's neural tissue. All right, and as such, it does not make its own hormones. All it does is store and release them. Now, if the posterior pituitary doesn't make the hormones, where are the hormones made? The hypothalamus. Excellent. So how does the hypothalamus get those hormones to the posterior pituitary? The hypothalamic hypophysial tract. Okay, absolutely a bundle of axons could between the two, but we also have another name for that. Is what the is the name for that bundle of axons that connects the hypothalamus to the posterior pituitary? Is it the infundibulum? It is indeed. Via the infundibulum. Excellent. Then those pituocytes uh, collect and store the hormones. So when it's time to release the hormones, how does our hypothalamus do that? Now, does our hypothalamus tell these pituocytes in the posterior pituitary to release their hormones? How are they regulated? Neurally? Yeah. All right. It sends action potentials down the infundibulum to the posterior pituitary, and it stimulates the cells to release their hormones. So it is a direct neural connection.
And that direct neural connection was already there because that's how it's giving it the hormones to begin with. So much simpler, much more straightforward. Thank you. Yep. Questions on this? All right. I think when Hakeb asked that question, someone else had a question at the same time. Was there somebody else who was uh, had something they wanted? I was just going to ask about the gross anatomy of the endocrine system, like the worksheet that we did. That's mostly going to be lab exam, right? Um, or it could be both. It definitely could be both. Absolutely. I mean, could I have uh, essay questions that say, you know, give an example of neural control or how is uh, production of insulin regulated or something along those lines? I mean, those things make decent questions or even multiple choice questions, essay questions, those kind of things. Um, it is the primary component of the endocrine lab exam, because we're basically, the lab portion of the endocrine is basically identify this gland and then tell me everything you know about the hormone that's produced there. Uh, so definitely it's, it's, it's the major endocrine component of the lab exam, but easily uh, that type of how these things are regulated, what hormones are produced in what glands, those are things that make decent questions on a lecture exam as well. Again, remember, it's, it's even, it, the lines are even more blurred in a class like this, but even when we're online, but even when we're in the classroom, you just gotta remember that lab and lecture are just different learning modalities. Some things it makes more sense for me to stand at the board and yell and write and dance up and down. And others, it makes more sense for you to be clustered in groups and working with materials at your desk. But it's all the same class and it's all the same material. So everything you learn, you're responsible for on both exams. And so, yeah, I could easily see uh, some of those endocrine things on that handout being on the lecture exam. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. I think I was just wondering with like the lab exam, how they would lend themselves to like a photo and how you would ask that question. Well, so kind I, of so, identify this and what you know about it basically. Yeah. So let's say for instance, there was a histology slide that just happened. And since I'm such a horrible artist will just totally cheat and do something like this. You saw a particular slide, histology slide that happened to have this big circular stuck structure with a lot of fluid in the center of it, right? One question I could possibly ask for this is to identify the gland. And what gland would this be? Thyroid. Excellent, thyroid. so this is the thyroid gland, right? So I could do that. But notice also the other thing that I could do on the lab exam is I could have a nice big fat arrow and point it here. And oh God, let's figure out all the questions I could ask. Identify the structure. Follicular cell. Yeah, well, the, okay, the, struct, the entire structure is a follicle, but you're right. Then I could also ask you to identify the cell and you would say follicular cell, right? I could even say identify the tissue type. What tissue type is this? Simple cuboidal. Keep simple cuboidal. Excellent. Identify the class of hormones that is produced by this cell. This is four. I like how you guys are going to get the hard question right. The most easy question. Like amino acid. Are you talking like amino acid or lipid based? Nope. Although that's a good question too. Okay, let's ask the, the, the harder question. Identify two specific hormones made by this cell. I rock T3 some. and T4. And are you gonna really say T3 and T4 on the exam? No, but that's still on my list to study. <laughs> okay, but what are you gonna actually write on the exam? Thyroxin and uh, tryoxin. Yeah, triiodothyronine, exactly. Excellent. Those are two specific types of hormones. What's the class of hormones? Thyroid stimulating hormones? Not thyroid stimulating, just thyroid hormones. T3 and T4 okay. are collectively known as thyroid hormones. Okay. Uh, you were correct. I could ask, is it a lipid-based or amino acid-based? 
hormone? What type of hormone is produced here? Lipid based or amino acid based? Amino acid. Excellent. Uh, what is the target of the hormone that is produced here? Target or targets? Most cells. The whole target. body. Yeah, most cells of the body. Excellent. Uh, uh, effect of the cells, I mean, of the hormone produced by the cell? Increased metabolism, uh, heart rate, uh, blood pressure. Perfect. How is production of hormone produced in this cell? How is hormone production regulated in this cell? Uh, hormonally by thyroid stimulating hormone. There you go. It's just that simple. And what's really fun about this particular picture is there's going to be another cell over here. Identify that cell. Is that the cell? Parathyroid? No, although that's a good guess. Parafollicular? I'll make it. There you go. Exactly. Let's put another follicle here and another follicle here and another follicle here so that that way, that's the parafollicular cell, excellent. Uh, identify the hormone produced here by the cell. Parathyroid hormone? No, again, this is the, para, this is the parafollicular cell. So this is still in the thyroid gland. We could, and yeah, we could do that next if you want. We could look at Is that. Calcitonin. There you go, calcitonin. Excellent. Uh, target of the hormone produced or targets of the hormone produced in this cell? The kidneys, digestive system. Osteoclasts. Excellent. Effect? Reduce amount of calcium in the blood. Excellent. How is it regulated? Humorally by Maybe calcium. calcium. Uh, calcium levels there you go exactly and you're right over here next to the thyroid we could have the parathyroid gland which we know has two types of cells uh, there are some smaller tightly packed cells and then there are some bigger lighter colored cells that's not even light enough bigger lighter colored cells in here as well what were these lighter color cells again Oxyphils. Oxyphils, excellent. But what we probably care most about are these little cells here. Identify this gland. Chief cells? Oh, sorry. No, I'm sorry. Identify the gland. Parathyroid? Parathyroid gland, exactly. And you are also correct, they are the chief cells. Hormone produced by this cell? Parathyroid. Hormone, parathyroid hormone, excellent. Targets? The same, so like the osteoclasts, the digestive system. Kidneys. Kidneys, excellent. Effect? Increased Increase calcium, calcium in blood. Uh, How is it regulated? Humorally via calcium. There you go. So yeah, the, the endocrine portion of this exam, and I would say this lab exam Again, this is a total rough number, and honestly, I'm not even 100% sure it's right. But if you think about the amount of material we covered, it's probably going to be about 50, 40 to 50% endocrine. Probably there wasn't as much histology and, and stuff like that for the immune response. So maybe 20% immune and 30% lymphatic, something like that. So kind of somehow split. 50-50 that way, 50 between lymphatic and immune, and 50 between the endocrine. And these are the kind of questions. This is exactly the questions that I will be asking for the endocrine portion. I will show you either a chart showing a full gross anatomy of a gland or histology slide showing you the microscopic anatomy of a gland. And then once you figure out what that gland is, uh, or that cell is, you should be able to tell me all those other pieces of information on the list. 
what is the hormone, what is the target of the hormone, what is the effect of the hormone, and how is that hormone regulated? And so that's going to be probably somewhere close to, you know, 40 to 50 percent of your lab exam. Uh, Professor, going yes. to the uh, lymph histology, um, the histology that we're responsible for is on that list you gave us, right? So like right. the pancreas patches and the intestines aren't really on there, um, but it's it's on the lecture notes. So that's why I was still. Little... Yeah. So pyrus patches are definitely something we talked about and definitely something you should recognize. If there isn't that, if that isn't on the histology, we talked about it enough in uh, lecture that you should know it. But for instance, okay. notice we never looked at the microscopic anatomy of the uh, thyroid gland. We didn't do, I mean, of the, uh, of the uh, thymus. We didn't do it in the immune response. We didn't, in, we didn't do it in lymphatic. So notice the histology of that isn't gonna be something on the exam. A histology of the appendix isn't something we looked at. So that's not gonna be something that you're gonna be responsible for. And um, notice histologically, I'm not going to make you look at a histology slide of a tonsil and have you tell me whether it's the lingual or the pharyngeal. But if I show you that chart with the mouth big and open and I point to a tonsil in there, should you be able to tell which, uh, which uh, tonsil is which in the gross anatomy? Yes. Yeah. So yes, but, but I wouldn't do it histologically. So yes. I think it, so the, the small intestine isn't on the histology list. That would be the one thing. The pyrus patches, I think, are obvious enough where that should be something that you recognize because of the intestinal crypts, because of the villi, that that's something you should be able to recognize. Got it. Okay. And, and that was actually my second question with the tonsils. Um, could you show us that picture again? Um, with yeah, the that's what we've <laughs> So let's do an easy one. Here is the chart in the classroom. This is the one that I get, I got from the, the uh, Cosumnes River College visual anatomy portion. Uh, notice we can see, we technically can see most of the tonsils in this one. Again, this one up here located up near the uh, top of the uh, pharynx uh, next to the nasal cavity. What's that one that I've highlighted pink? Angel. Pharyngeal. Uh, what is this one right here? Lingual. Lingual. And it's a little hard to see, but if you look closely on that lateral wall right there is a tonsil there. What would that tonsil be? The adenoids. Um... Now remember the adenoids is actually the other name for the uh, pharyngeal. The palatine. Palatine, exactly. Notice it's not the best view of the palatine. Something like, oh, this one's cool. This isn't the one I was meaning. But notice up here, you can actually see the adenoids up here, the pharyngeal tonsil up at the top, right across from the nasal cavity. Remember, this one does a nice job of showing the parathyroid glands on the back of the thyroid glands. So that's cool there. But that wasn't what I was looking for. I was looking for, ah, this is a great one. Notice with this uh, transverse section, we are able to clearly see the lingual tonsils right here. But notice also the other thing that we can see in this one is these two pieces of chewing gum located right here. Notice they're between these arches. This is an arch and this is an arch. And then there's this pouch on the lateral aspect of the oral cavity. And this pouch is known as the foss, formed by where these two arches come. And sitting in that foss is where you find the palatine tonsils, the paired palatine tonsils on the side. Notice if I, hopefully they have it. No, where am I gonna find that picture? Um, I thought for sure digestion. Oh, maybe digestion is where I'll see it. Let's try that one. Oops, hold on. Ready. 
There we go. That's what I wanted. So notice here, again, you can see there's one of those arches. Here's the second arch. And this one is kind of peeled away because the mucous membrane has been removed. But notice you can see laterally right here and right here within that phallus, within that pouch, are those two palatine tonsils. So in something like this, could I have an arrow pointing here and ask you to identify this specific structure and you need to know it's a palatine tonsil? Yeah, absolutely. Or like I said, uh, you know, something like this where you need to be able to identify the lingual tonsils and so on. Yes, so from the gross anatomy, I would expect you to be able to distinguish them, but not histologically. Thank you so much, Professor. Yep. All righty. Anything else? So for the, the testes, um, the histologically, the uh, nurse cells, I think you mentioned they have a uh, triangular shaped nucleus. I, I was wondering if we could uh, actually see one. I don't, I don't think we saw a clear picture of one. Yeah. horrible picture. Um, so let's try this. All right. This is like one of those things, you know, the lawyer is never supposed to ask the question that he doesn't know the answer to. I don't actually know if this is here, but I'm imagining it's here. I'd be shocked if it's not here. Uh, so let's take a look at this. We are at the Yale histology site, which is an amazing site. We go to the, feet, to the male reproductive system and go down to the slides. And as we go down to the slides, uh, Sertoli cells. Excellent. So notice here, this is indeed a nice view. Notice here, uh, this is an up close view of two seminiferous tubules back to back. Notice we can see all the cells in the different stages of development as they're moving towards the lumen and becoming the sperm shaped cells. But notice in the middle of all of these, we have these big, huge, elongated nuclei. Everything else is kind of smaller, it's circular, but here's another one, here's another one. We have these big elongated, uh, sometimes they're very sharply triangular or, uh, or, or diamond shape. Here's an example of one. Uh, so uh, here we can actually see one that's kind of triangular in shape. These uh, enlarged elongated nuclei are the nuclei of the Sotoli cells which are basically making all of the pink substance that is surrounding all of these immature sperm cells as they're dividing and uh, maturing into sperm-shaped cells. So something like that is, uh, is a really nice example of those, how you can kind of see that these nuclei are distinctly different from all of the different ones. And when we get to the reproductive system, we'll actually be able to tell what each of these cells is and identify them. We don't have to worry about that right now, but these big obvious uh, elongated nuclei are those Sertoli cells. Thank you. Yep. All right, what else? We all done? All righty. Uh, as always, as I said, uh, I will uh, actually, that was the other thing I was going to say. I will try to get your um, uh, uh, group presentations graded. I'll see if I can get that done tonight, although it may be a little tricky. I may do it tomorrow during my office hours after, because remember, I have the morning class. So if it's not tonight, it won't be till tomorrow afternoon. But I'll try to get them graded and posted uh, before the presentations. 
I mean, before the, the lab and lecture exams, although everybody did uh, really well. So uh, I anticipate the grades to be good on those. Uh, so, uh, but I have, I have to look at the outlines and do stuff like that. So uh, uh, give me a, a day at most and I'll have those graded and back to you, uh, posting them on, uh, on a Canvas. And then uh, if you guys have any questions, remember I have office hours tomorrow from 12.30 to 1.30. Uh, and I will have office hours in the hour before our exam as always, so 11 to 12. So if you have any last minute questions, uh, that's the perfect opportunity to get that information as well. Uh, so I wish you guys great success. As always, read the questions carefully. People often lose points, not because they don't know the information, but because they don't ask, the, they don't read the question carefully, right? If I'm pointing at a follicular cell, but I say identify the gland, then don't say follicular cell. Make sure you are saying that it is the thyroid gland, right? Or don't get excited because you see that it's a follicular cell because the question may be identify the class of hormones that are produced there. So read the questions carefully so you can answer them correctly. All right, guys, good luck, and I will see you next week. Thank you. Bye.